Hi guys, I'm back again today with a continuation of Sira series, The Story of the Prophet, please be upon him. They gave half of their wealth in charity. So this is episode 27 and uh, I hope you saw the other parts. There is a playlist on the channel for this, for episode one until now mm -hmm. so if you haven't seen it go check that out well before we start don't forget to subscribe click the bell button and let's go straight into the video the daily reminders network we know that the Madani period is shorter than the Meccan era. The Meccan era lasted 13 years, the Madani lasted 10 years. The Madani period can be divided into three very three clear eras or categories. The, the first is the era of consolidation, the era of strengthening, the era of internal dissent being eliminated. And there were internal dissents from both the hypocrites and the, the Yahud. And also, by the way, there are also pagans in the beginning. Slowly oh. but surely, the pagans are eliminated. The hypocrites basically minimize, they are not eliminated. And then the Yehud as well are expelled or they're also eliminated in the end. And they were also facing external threats. And the external threats primarily were from the Quraysh. So the first era was the elimination of any serious threat. And this era is from the beginning of the Hijrah up until basically the Battle of Ahzab is when the tables really began to turn. That's the fifth year of the Hijrah. Internal and external opposition is either eliminated or minimized to the extent that the existence of the Islamic State is no longer in threat. The second era is the era of truce. And this lasted two and a half years from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, basically, up until the conquest of Mecca. And in this era, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims witnessed a peace along with the coexistence of non-Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ is sending out letters, emissaries, envoys. The Muslim Ummah expands fivefold in the era of peace, much more than it expanded in the era of war. And that is the sixth, seventh, and eighth years of the Hijrah, basically. Is and this the same era wherein that's how i pronounce it i'm not sure which one is the right pronunciation maybe there's none but anyways the era of um where he was sending the letters and envoys is this the same time when he sent the letter to heraclus is that his name because we did react to that before you see this video i think you would have seen that uh video then the final era is the era of the complete establishment of the oh, Republic of Islam. And that was when Allah revealed fi dinillahi afwaja. That is the ultimate victory that the entire peninsula embraced Islam en masse. And that is basically the post-conquest of Mecca up until the death of the Prophet of the early things that the Prophet ﷺ did was he did the famous, it's called Mu'akha. And Mu'akha means making people brothers. Oh, he made a Mu'akha, a brotherly bond between the Muhajirun and the Ansar. It is even reported in Sahih Bukhari that when the Muhajirun came, the Ansar came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, O Messenger of Allah, we shall give half of our land over to the Muhajirun. Because all of the Muhajirun were poor. None of them had the money that they had in Mecca. Wow. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for them, but he refused to accept such a generous gift. And he said, they will take care of the manual labor and you will share in the produce, i.e. let them do work for the dates and for the privilege. And also the Prophet ﷺ insisted and encouraged them to be generous to one another. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the generosity of the Ansar. Now in this verse, Allah uses a noun for Medina that He doesn't use anywhere else. And that is the house. Meaning this is where you're going to feel at home. And Allah calls the Ansar those who prepared the house. It is technically the house of the Ansar. And so if Allah had said those who had prepared their house, this would have been accurate. But Allah didn't. Because what did the Ansar do? They gave up half of their house to the Muhajirun. Allah is saying the Ansar prepared the house, the house for them. And they found no hesitancy to give everything. And they preferred others over themselves. Even if they themselves were in poverty. And so they gave the Muhajirun everything they needed from home to food to animals. And subhanAllah, this shows us the spirit of Islam. That the Prophet did not want these free handouts. The Prophet said, no, they shall do work. They're going to do their manual labor. They'll take their wages in date and in food, and you can take your wages or your percentage as well. And so the process of is encouraging being brotherly, being kind, being generous. But he went a step further than this, and that is he instituted the concept of mu'akha, which means every muhajir was paired with an ansari. And in this stage, 
the pairing was so complete that they would be considered like brothers, even in inheritance. That if one of them died, the other would inherit his money. This was of course later abrogated. And it is mentioned that over 100 such pairs were done, which basically means for every single male muhajir, there was a pair done. Abu Bakr was with Khalid ibn Zayd, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was with Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah, Salman al-Farsi was with Abu Darda. Every time you find a pairing, if you look at their biographies, you actually find a lot in common. So Khalid ibn Zayd was one of the noblemen of the Ansar. And Abu Bakr, you know who he is. So the Prophet paired them together. Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah was a rich businessman. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf used to be rich in Mecca, right? When he migrated, he has nothing now. But businessmen. So the Prophet knows exactly who he's pairing with who. Every single one that we find, we find a good pair done. Every one of these names that have been paired together, we actually find them mentioned in the seerah many times together. Which means that they took this pairing together very seriously. And yeah. the Ansar in fact helped the Muhajirun so much that the Muhajirun came to the Prophet ﷺ worried about something. They said that, O Messenger of Allah, we have never seen any group of people like these that we have come to. They share equally with us at times of difficulty and are generous with us at times of ease. They have taken care of our needs and allowed us to share with them in good, so much so that we are worried, Ya Rasulullah, that they will take all of our ajr away from us. That they've done so much that all of those years in Mecca that we were persecuted, all of those years that we were tortured, all of the wealth and money we had to leave behind, the hijrah and the problems of the hijrah, all of this, Ya Rasulullah, we're worried that it's all going to be handed to them because they're so nice to us. And so the Prophet ﷺ said that no, they will not get all of your reward as long as you praise them and make dua for them. The mu'akha was begun in this era and it continued up until the very end, even after the conquest of Mecca. So for example, Salman al-Farsi and Abu Darda, Salman al-Farsi did not accept Islam for a few years. He didn't accept Islam right at the Hijrah and still the Prophet ﷺ makes mu'akha. It is also mentioned, for example, that Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was made a brother with Hattat al-Taymi and Muawiyah accepted Islam after Fatih Mecca. So this shows us that the concept of pairing people together, it lasted throughout the entire course of the Madani phase. And when you look at this early society of Muslims, no society in the history of mankind has been as selfless, as generous to strangers as this group of people. No. Even blood brothers would not do for their blood brothers what the Ansar did for the Muhajirun. And that is why loving the Ansar is a sign of faith and Iman. Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said that the sign of Iman is to love the Ansar. And a sign of hypocrisy is to hate the Ansar. And in fact, so much is the blessings of the Ansar. The Prophet ﷺ even said to them that if I could, I would give up my lineage and be a part of you. I can't change biologically that I'm Qurashi. I cannot change that I'm from Mecca. Were it not for the fact that I come from Mecca, I would have considered myself one of the Ansar. If all of mankind went in one direction and the Ansar went in another direction, I would choose the direction of the Ansar. The next major incident of the early Madani period is the Treaty of Medina. So when you go back to the seat of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq mentions the entire treaty, but he says, it has been narrated to me. And between him and the Prophet is 150 years. Other early books sometimes mention this treaty as well, but again, without a full chain of narrators, some of the books of hadith, so for example, Muslim Imam Ahmad, it has a phrase of this treaty. The problem comes, as we said, there is no early book that mentions the whole treaty with an isnad. However, many modern researchers say, even if there's no chain of narrators, when you look at this treaty and the language of the treaty, it's a very archaic language, a language that is not common in the time of even Ibn Ishaq. So if somebody were to fabricate it, he wouldn't have fabricated it with such a, a difficult language. And therefore, the majority of scholars of our times consider this treaty to be an authentic treaty. And we're not going to discuss every single clause because it takes up five pages. What we're going to do is we're going to break up the treaty into four areas. Number one, the first issue is everything related to the Muslims. Number two, everything related to the Jews. Number three, everything related to the Mushrikun, the pagans. And number four, general treaties for all of these. Clauses related to the Muslims amongst themselves. Of the clauses, the Prophet ﷺ is saying in this treaty that the Mu'minun from the Quraysh and Yathrib and those who join them are one Ummah. And this Ummah, he said, is in and unto itself, i.e. it is unique to itself to the exclusion of the rest of mankind. And he then mentions 
40 sub-tribes, as we said. He mentions every one of them. They mention the Muhajirun by name, the Banu Awf, the Banu Harid, the Banu Sa'idah, on and on again. And he says, every one of these sub-tribes will be left with their own responsibilities that they had before Islam. They shall take care of their own blood money disputes, their own prisoners of war, and their own poor. All of the Muslims shall unite against those who do injustice, even if it be one of their own. So this means if somebody does dhulm, even if he's a Muslim, we will be united against the dhalim. The Prophet yeah. said the protection granted by the Muslims is the same. The word for protection in Arabic is dhim. And even the lowliest of them can give protection. What is the concept of dhim? So again, in that Islamic state, how did somebody get a visa to enter Darul Islam? The Prophet is saying, every Muslim has the right to give anybody whom they know this visa. Even if they are the lowliest of them, meaning even if they're not even free, even if they are a slave, even if it's a child who's aftin, a child who understands, like not a three-year-old, but an eight, nine-year-old, right? This is the majority opinion. And if somebody comes in with that visa, what does this mean? It means nobody can harm him. The second set of clauses are clauses related to the Yehud. And he mentions the Yehud of the Bani Auf, and the Yehud of the Bani Amr, and the Yehud of the Bani this, and the Yehud of the Bani that. And there are again around 12 different clauses. The Prophet said, all of these Yehud are one Ummah along with the believers. Ummatan ma'al mu'mineen. And they shall take care of their own affairs, their own internal disputes. They will take care of their own fuqara. They will take care of their own blood money, internal crime, internal murder, internal. They are in charge. Unless they wish to come to us, otherwise we have no business with them. Unless it involves the two together. If there's dhulm, if there's murder between the two ummas, now it will go to the higher authority. Something happens between the two, then obviously we need to come to the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet said that between the two, i.e. the Muslims and the Jews, shall be mutual support against those who fight the people of this treaty. And the Yahud will spend along with the Muslims as long as they're being fought. Financial obligations when it comes to external enemies are the same. And at times of crises, therefore, the two shall unite and help one another, and the Yahud are responsible for the cost, and the Muslims are responsible for the cost. The Prophet also added here with regards to the Yahud, no Yahudi can leave Medina without the permission of the Prophet. Leaving means changing your citizenship. That's what it means in that language. So the Prophet, you, you cannot just do that. You have to inform us, you have to tell us. You can't just go and become a traitor. You cannot just or, or even leave and become neutral. This must be informed so that we know that you're no longer a part of this treaty. Another clause, if any Jew wishes to follow the believers, i.e. to convert, then he shall be helped and protected and no injustice shall be done to him. Some of the clauses related to the pagans, the mushrikun. No mushrik shall offer protection to the Quraysh even if it is in return for life or money. Nor shall he in any way come between the Quraysh and the believers, i.e. to defend. If you're in Medina, you cannot support them physically. What's in your heart is in your heart. But you cannot support them, nor can you defend them, nor can you come between us and them. Stay out of this business. Why? Because, of course, at the time, to be pagan meant your alliances are with the Quraysh or with the people of Mecca. So the Prophet said, you must remain neutral. You're never allowed to take any sides over here. The final set of clauses were general clauses pertaining to all of the people of the treaty. Number one, the Prophet said, the interior of Yathrib is a haram for the people of this treaty. Haram means sacred land. And he mentions that no wild trees can be plucked and no game can be hunted and so on and so forth. And he also delineated or demarcated what is Medina. So he mentioned four points, Lab Bateha and Ayr and Thor. Ayr and Thor are two small mountains, south and north of Medina. And Lab Bateha are the two Harratain, are the two volcanic plains. And he specified these four points are what make Medina Haram. Outside of this is not a Haram. He also said, whatever disagreement occurs so between like the peoples of this treaty, which shall lead to internal fasad, shall be decided by Allah and His Messenger. Also the Prophet said, it will not be allowed for any believer who agrees to this treaty and believes in Allah and the last day to help any rebel, anybody who opposes this treaty, to support him. Whoever 
does so will have the la'na of Allah and the mala'ika and all of mankind. Whoever does so, Allah will curse him and the angels will curse him until the day of judgment and no good deed will be accepted from him. And this of course meant also execution. And the final point that he mentioned in this long treaty that whoever leaves Medina shall be safe, whoever stays in Medina shall be safe except for anyone who does an injustice or sin. And Allah will protect those who are pious and righteous and Muhammad Sallallahu is his messenger. I really like his narrations all the time because it's clear, he explains the point, he gives us examples, he translates uh, other stuff in English that me will never understand, right? So um, I love this storytelling, like um, we learned so much about the Prophet and about how like Islam came to be, right? Slowly but surely we're kind of like picturing the growth of islam and let me know what you guys thought if you like this video don't forget to give this video a thumbs up subscribe i'll see you in the next video bye